Suspect wearing blue jeans, white. As I was younger, I, I didn't necessarily really understand. I knew my uncles were involved in gangs. Uh, it was kind of an expectation to identify and, and be part of the local gang. I mean, a lot of times that was the only way that you could feel safe and protected outside of your home environment. Turf wars and retaliation are a reality among rival gangs. This had been something that had been going on with the rival gang for a very long time. Often with tragic consequences. Made a phone call just to see how one of my friends were doing. Turns out right at the time that I called, there was a drive-by shooting. Heard the gunshots, heard his mom scream, heard the babies cry. Uh, immediately dropped the phone and ran down the street. This act of violence shook a community and altered the life of Sione Havili forever. And so we decided to, to retaliate. This is his journey, a story of redemption, proof that someone once broken can be redeemed. I had two sets of friends. Uh, I had those that were in the football circle and we all aspired to go to college and leverage football to get ourselves out of the neighborhood. Sione was a powerhouse on the football field. His speed and athleticism got him noticed. So he was in my camps from the very beginning. And so I, I loved his athleticism, his toughness. You knew right away there was something special about him as a, as a, as a leader and, and something that he was gonna, he was, he was destined to do something special. He played varsity for three years, and uh, you know, his junior and senior year, he was like the star. My father was very vocal, you know, sports being the vehicle or the ticket for us to, to go to college and to pursue a higher education. A lot of us had that potential to go to college, have school paid for, um, with football scholarships. Sione was one of the most highly recruited athletes in the state of Utah. We were all big, bigger than, than our classes and stuff like that, but, but Sione's speed was something that uh, distinguished him, his agility, his uh, athleticism. He was a great student and popular too. Junior year, we were both nominated as royalty for winter prom, I guess, or Christmas ball. That was our first initial meeting. One of our teachers referred to him as Professor Sione because he was just so smart. Looking back now, you realize he, he was clearly a bigger recruit. He was actually getting offers from other schools. Utah, Nebraska, and Texas Tech were among the schools Sione considered. It was a decision that the whole family took seriously. So for three days, uh, I was in a room just praying and fasting about, you know, going to, you know, which decision that I should make. And so as I come out and, and uh, my dad asked for where I wanted to go, uh, I said a place that he didn't want me to go to. And so he told me to go back in the room and tell Heavenly Father tells me BYU. <laughs> <laughs> and so by way of uh, Tongan Free Agency, I, I made my decision. And, and I actually was really happy with it. I grew up as a BYU fan. Knew that there was going to be a battle with, with a lot of the recruits that we were going after. But knew that there was a connection from him to this place. After signing with BYU, he deferred his college career to serve a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Submitted my papers, was fully prepared, received my call to go to the New York, New York South Mission, ready to leave at the end of January. Life was looking good for Sione, but he still had ties to a rougher crowd. One interesting thing is from the time I received the call, my call to the time that I left, there was an insurmountable amount of temptation um, to do certain things that were part of my, my past life. See, there were guys there in Glendale that were, that were different from them, right? Those guys played ball, they had purpose, they were doing their deal, and they had other guys that were completely just entrenched in gangs. And you knew the differences between the two. You knew that they were all from Glendale, but you knew, okay, these guys kind of are on a different path, and these guys are on a different path. And Shona was one of those that you always, when, when I met, I thought, okay, this, this guy's, this guy's gonna have a bright future. Obviously, I was laser focused on, you know, going to New York City. And uh, one of my buddies happened to be at, at another house. So I, I made a phone call. And uh, when I made the phone call to my neighbor's house, an another friend of mine just heard gunshots. And uh, I dropped the phone and dashed out the door. His friends were victims of a rival gang drive-by shooting. And as I ran to the house, I just saw that they were distraught. Without thinking, and just weeks before entering the missionary training center, 
Siona and five others sought revenge. In October 1998, a gang-related drive-by shooting prompted swift revenge. With no regard to the consequences, Sione Havili and five others struck back. Initially, I think the goal was is just to, you know, do a drive-by, but nobody was home. With two one-gallon containers of gas and rags for fuse, they firebombed a rival's house, burning it to the ground. You know, one event uh, happened after another, and, you know, we ended up burning down the house. And uh, no, nobody was killed or hurt. Nobody was killed or hurt. There was no evidence. He kept quiet about his involvement and continued preparing for his mission. Two months later, uh, I ended up leaving on my mission. I didn't have any ecclesiastical interviews between the time I had received my mission call and, and I had left. And so I was caught between a rock and a hard spot. I heard that he, he was coming out. You hear about the new batch of missionaries and you're always looking like, okay, who are the, who are the Tongan boys that are coming in? I saw the name. I immediately knew who it was. And Sean hit the ground running and he was a district leader fast. He was training young. He was a zone leader really quickly. His mission was a highlight, but then his past caught up to him. I was out, got a phone call from uh, Salt Lake City Gang Task Force detective uh, notifying me that I had been implicated as the mastermind of a uh, firebombing that happened back in Salt Lake. Uh, and then my mission president called me and uh, we sat down and we talked and uh, he had made an arrangement for me not to be extradited but to voluntarily go home and to speak with the detectives. And so the very next day, uh, I didn't pack up my stuff. Uh, I thought I'd be coming back. It was a humiliating experience, returning home under those circumstances. He went and picked him up from the airport, came home to the house and uh, the first thing he came in, I could sense that he was so uh, remorseful, very embarrassed. Um, I told him, son, I love you. Just know that we all make mistakes and you will come back. It, and you, you know, but you must pay the consequence. I remember the day he was returning back. We, uh, my sister called all of her siblings to come over to the house. And when we saw him there, um, I could see in his face that he may have let, may have let us down. And I felt like I was doing good things, but it was just this one decision that I'd made prior to leaving that eventually caught up with me. While waiting for his case to go to trial, he served the last few months of his mission in Salt Lake City. When he returned back from his mission early, um, it was kind of weird how he was assigned to our ward, and at the time I was the ward mission leader. And I thought out of the 100 wards that he could have been assigned to, he came to our ward. He, he had no fear when he approached people. He would go up to them and, and uh, just let them know about the gospel, shared the gospel the way it should have been. Obviously, now that I know the bigger picture, it was meant to be. So it had to finish his mission and he finished honorably. With his court date looming, he was facing serious charges. And I was face, facing 15 years to life. Uh, I was given the opportunity that if I take a first degree that I would only serve one year. Uh, I figured that was probably the best step for me to move forward was to take that deal. He was sent to serve his time in the Salt Lake County Jail. So I was a guard and I had heard what happened. It, it shocked me because I thought he went to church, mission, all that good stuff, and then here he made a mistake, and so I was like, Sione, we need to keep you busy in here because this ain't a place to be. But I remember he, he was so good, he actually baptized people, so much so that the first day he walked into prison, one of his baptisms on the top level, was, hey, Elder Havili! Yeah, so, but did he shy away? No. He kept that conversation on. He knew what he did. He's in jail, but he's like, you know what? This doesn't define me. I'm still a member of the church. I messed up. Now I got to pay and get back to the good graces. So I wanted to keep him busy, to keep his mind busy, to stay away from all that other stuff. So I asked him if he'd be open to getting a trustee job. I used trustees in the library because I just, just did not have enough staff. I handpicked him, and I was pretty careful who I picked. Did you know that he had already served uh, 
church mission. He had started a church mission, that he was a scholarship athlete at BYU. I did. As a matter of fact, when he came home from his mission, while he was waiting trial, and he finished to serve some time, it, it, was, it was in my stake. And one day I, I was talking to him and I said, are you sorry you came or what if you'd have gotten off? It was something along those lines. And he said, you know what? I, I, needed, I need to be here. I need to serve my time. This is part of what I need to do to fully repent. I thought he's the only person I have ever heard in jail, ever, in the 70,000 people I have ever worked with that has ever said, I need to be here. The atonement can pay for our sins, but we also have to pay our own restitution. Sione was released after nine months for good behavior, and after a time, was able to marry his high school sweetheart, Lenny. His wife stayed by him through all of this, through, through being in jail, whatever problems he had, she stayed by him. She was always there for him. I went to his wedding. I, I cried. I cried when he came in. When he came in the temple, I cried. I just sobbed because the last I'd seen him was in gray. I think a uh, big, big reason for his success as well is just, has been his wife and his life and, and uh, you know, them getting through those dark times together when nobody else is, was there. It's just behind closed doors, kneeling down together, praying together, just uh, sticking through it. And with everything we've been blessed with, that same happiness is still the same, if not stronger. And I'm truly grateful that he was, he went through what he did because it had made him who he is today. Absolutely. I believe that. Sione Havili was once a highly recruited Division I football player. Criminal activity stole that from him when he and five others firebombed a rival gang member's house. Words can't express how, how regretful I am for the decision that I made. And I think my life would have been a little different, but I think everything happens for a reason. After serving time for his crime, he was hoping to return to the football field once again. BYU was no longer an option. And now you're looking to try to get someplace. Yeah, um, just really understanding where I could go. And, and I think my loyalty back to Coach Mack, I just felt like that was a good fit. 31-yard punt and no return. His old friend, Ron McBride, welcomed him to the University of Utah team. But once administrators learned he was a felon, they rescinded too. So I get a, I get a call and they say, well, I uh, just want to let you know that we're not going to let Sione Havili play or be on a football team at the University of Utah. So you're off the team just like that? Just like that. And I said, for what reason? Well, he's a, he's a convicted felon. You know, obviously, I don't, I don't blame BYU, I don't blame Utah. I made a decision that certainly altered the, the rest of my life. Texas Tech eventually picked him up, and he played there for a couple of seasons. Yeah, I loved my time at Texas Tech. Uh, obviously, maximized that opportunity to get a you know, free college education. Uh, I had graduated, and uh, coincidentally, Coach Mack got the job at Weber State. With one more year of eligibility, Sione returned to Utah to play for Coach McBride and pursue a master's degree at Weber State. A week before the first game, I was running routinely as I always do. Uh, had a collision, ended up blinking, and uh, felt like something was in my eye. Long story short, I had a stroke, and I went blind in my left eye. And that was the end of my football career at 25 years old with football no longer an option. I had lost about 95% of my vision in my left eye, and so I could only see in the top right corner. He was forced to start over once again. Uh, my dad ended up coming to give me a blessing that, that very next day. And the very next day I woke up and uh, 
50% of my eye was restored, my eyesight was restored. Still to this day, I'm about 50% blind, but it was definitely a, 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 an amazing uh, testament uh, of everything that we had been through to continue to, to stay on this path. But finding a new career path wasn't easy. I mean, imagine being a first degree felon. First thing they, th they see is that on the application, it was very, very difficult to get an interview. His first job was in sales. A couple of years later, he had hopes of working in the tech industry, but competition was stiff. You get an interview with, with Adobe, and you're one of eight or 900 applicants. So tell me what happened. I'd never been in a panel interview like this before. He came in and interviewed, and uh, it was an awesome interview. The first thing that they said was, you know, there are hundreds of applicants, and we're just trying to, you know, find what's wrong in, in applicants so that we continue through this process. And so I had this epiphany um, because of my background that I just needed to be upfront with them. He said, I, you know, I, I need to be honest with you. I've been involved in something and I have a felony. I told him I was a convicted felon. The room went quiet. <laughs> so I spent about 30 minutes telling my story. There was just something about Sione. You know, he, he was so committed to his faith, which, which is such a rare thing. I never got the feeling that I, I need to pull back. And uh, immediately after I was done, they went straight up to San Jose and got executive approval to hire me. He's, he's easily the greatest hire that I've ever made in my career. His career success continues in the tech industry. He is now an executive at Domo and handles some of their biggest accounts. As you look back at your life and your career, you could not have had any glimpse, any way of seeing or knowing that this was in your future. Had no idea. Um, you know, there were tender mercies and people that were placed along the way that I think really helped accelerate and, and uh, provide those opportunities. Uh, I don't think those were coincidences, Vi. I really do think those were the, the Lord's way of staying anonymous and helping me get there. But no, I, am, I would have never fathomed, uh, you know, things materialize to the way they are today in, 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 in my success in my life. Every day I interact with him, he doesn't shy away from something that needs to be done. Seeking forgiveness from the victim, Sione sought her out. And I had a chance with myself, my wife, my kids, and my parents to sit down with the mother of the family. I saw them at the door. Right away I know who it is. To, to share and express my apologies and, and sorrow for everything that had happened. And it just melt my heart. I mean, I expressed to, to them not a day goes by that I don't regret what I've done. And I wish I could have taken back that night. Yeah, we forgive, we forgive. And that's what the church teaches us. Forgive and try to forget. An extremely awesome experience of, of redemption and, and uh, forgiveness that I, I never would have fathomed. You forgive your brother. He did terrible, but right then, it's gone. That is the blessing of true repentance. You're able to let it go. You remember it, but it doesn't hold you down because that's not what the atonement was meant for. It was meant to help you realize you made a mistake, but it does not define you. I love him and his family for doing that. I always tell Sione, I love you so much, but there's one more that loves you more, and your Heavenly Father loves you more than I do. So if you need anything, just get on your knees and ask him, and he will he will answer your prayers. But the beauty of the atonement of Jesus Christ is that the Lord has provided us an opportunity, regardless of any mistake that we make, that we can be forgiven of those things. Jess, you want to help them? Do that, because I'll be fast, and then you can start this. Those who know him learn from his journey, too. When the trials hit, he was, he was amazing in the way he would overcome them. So no matter how bad your situation is, 
If you have the mindset, that's what I've learned from Shone, you can make it happen. And if you don't get there tomorrow, it's the journey that's gonna strengthen you in the long run. Morning, Lola. How are you? And I'm not surprised that- Welcome, excellent. So Soraya? He's been what he's been on the spiritual end of things, right? The, the example that, that he's had for us. Uh, we'll open our hymn on uh, Tongue and Hymn Book. It's 27, Folo Fala, Maya Sisu. You always think about the prodigal son a little bit more like, like a, a son, but uh, you, know, you, see, you see a brother that goes through a lot of different hardships and, and ends up where he is. I mean, you know, the, the amount of joy that you feel in your heart for, for somebody like that. A good person that maybe just made a bad decision. Are you going to raise it in this one? Had we not gone through those trials, it would have not built our foundation as a couple together. Our, uh, our testimony of trials and the beauty of true forgiveness and redemption. I can't begin to state how grateful I am for the, the redeeming uh, principles of the gospel and for the opportunity for someone like me who is, who'd made a, a major mistake, had a very big lapse in judgment, and to be able to overcome all of those hur hurdles by the good grace of God, to enjoy such a wonderful life. I have a wonderful family. I'm married in the temple. I have a, an awesome job. And uh, I'm just so grateful. Words can't even explain. Tell me what your relationship with Sione is now. He's my counselor in my bishopric. Yes. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. And when he comes and, you know, I'm talking with everyone else, I says, that's my son right there. That's my son. And he would say, you're right, auntie. Mm -hmm.